His Excellency Rudiantara, Minister of Communication and Information Technology of the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency Abdul Qadir Amara, Minister of Equipment, Transport, Logistics and Water from Morocco. Her Excellency Aisha Mohammad Musa, Minister of Urban Development and Construction, Ethiopia. Her Excellency Pamela Charlotte, Minister for Habitat, Infrastructure and Land Transport, Seychelles. Mr. Zaki Gamal Yassin, CEO, LEN Industry. Mr. Elvin Guntoro, President Director, PT Dirgantara, Indonesia. Mr. Tazar Marta Kurniawan, Acting CEO of GMF Aero Asia. And the moderator is Ms. Kania Sunis, Sutis Nawati. And moderator, Kania Sutisna Winata. And to all participants, please kindly be seated. We will begin our second session very shortly. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to moderator. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here. I know this was supposed to be lunchtime, but please bear with us until about uh, 1.15 p.m. We have a very exciting session ahead. Uh, welcome again to the second session on connectivity. And uh, we have our most distinguished panelists with me on the stage. And before we start, I would like to give a short introduction, a formal introduction to each of the panelists that are present on the stage so we can have a clear sense of uh, their background and what they're going to be talking about. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce to my left His Excellency Rudiantara, Minister for Communications and Information Technology of the Republic of Indonesia, uh, inaugurated in October 2014 as part of President Joko Widodo's cabinet. Uh, Excellency Rudiantara has built a highly reputable career in the telecommunications sector and most notably for having to serve at the top level of management in Indonesia at all the three largest mobile network operators, which are Telkomsel, Indosat, and Excel Axiata, and also as an independent commissioner of state-owned incumbent operator, Telekomunikasi Indonesia. And under his leadership, some of the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology's top priority initiatives include the National Internet Backbone Network, the Palaparing, which, will, which he will elaborate a little bit more. Uh, early rollout of 4G mobile network and also support programs for digital entrepreneurship and promotion of Indonesia's next digital startup, Unicorns. So please uh, give a big round of applause for Minister Rudiantara. Thank you again, Minister, for joining us in this session. And next, we also have His Excellency Abdul Qadir Amara, Minister of Equipment, Transport, Logistics and Water, Morocco. His Excellency, uh, is the Minister of Equipment, Transport, Logistics and Water since uh, 5th of April 2015. He was also former Minister of Energy, Mines, Water, Environment, also former Ministry of Industry, Trade and New Technologies, was also Acting Minister of Health from uh, 30th of October 2017 to 22 of January 2018, and also the Minister of Economy and Finance from the 2nd to the 19th of August in 2018. And Dr. Amara holds a PhD from the Hassan II Institute of Agronomy and Veterinary, where he served as a professor from 1986 to 2002, and has also been for 10 years a scientific advisor of the Sweden-based International Foundation for Science. Please welcome a big round of applause for His Excellency. Thank you so much for joining us. Next to him, we have uh, Her Excellency Aisha Mohammed Musa, who is the Minister of Urban Development and Construction, Ethiopia. Welcome. 
Uh, she is one of the 10 women appointed to the 20 member cabinet serving in the government of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia in 2018. She is currently the Minister of Urban Development and Construction of Ethiopia, and prior to that, she was the first female assigned as the Minister of National Defense of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And she's a woman engineer. Yes, a big round of applause. Uh, she's a woman engineer with strong background in the country's construction industry. She started the career, her career as National United Nations volunteer at UNDP Urban Development Improvement Project. Welcome. And next, also present on stage, is Her Excellency Pamela Charlotte, Minister for Habitat, Infrastructure and Land Transport of Seychelles. Welcome. Uh, she's a Seychelles politician who presently serves as the Minister of Habitat, Lands, Infrastructure and Land Transport and has been since uh, the 27th of April last year. And under the administration of President Dani Fo, she's assigned to manage the $1.5 million housing project that was opened just recently. And previously, uh, his, Her Excellency served as the Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture in 2017 until 2018, after being Principal Secretary for Entrepreneurial Development and Business Innovation. Minister Charlotte also comes from the Eastern District of Anz Opin, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, was also the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Employment, Entrepreneurship, Development and Business Innovation. A big round of applause. Thank you for joining us, Her Excellency. And also we have uh, panelists from the private sector, mainly state-owned enterprises uh, from Indonesia. We have uh, Mr. Zaki Gamal Yassin. He is the CEO of LEN Industry. Uh, having experience and grown as a professional in PT Wika, where he started his career, he then assumed office in PT Barata Indonesia Persero as CEO in 2014 and 2016, and finally appointed as CEO of PT Land Industry until present. PT Land Industry is uh, known for producing and uh, mature and having mature experiences in developing electronic products and businesses for industry and facilitation, especially in signal system supporting in railway in various main railways in Java and Sumatra. And they have also successfully developed electronic products for strategic industry and under his leadership land industry scored achievement in 2018 such as ASEAN Outstanding Engineering, BWM and Branding and Marketing Award and land has also successfully been appreciated as top CSR 2018 and 2017, two consecutive years. Of course he will be talking more about his companies and the achievements later on uh, during our discussion. And also present here with us is uh, Mr. Alfin Guntoro, he's the CEO of PT Dirgantara Indonesia. He holds a postgraduate degree in management studies in Canterbury Business School and also accomplished doctorate degree in Universitas Pajajaran. And before taking his, uh, his current position, he was the main commissioners of Rumah Sakit Pelni and also previously worked in other uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, Pertamina IP Chepu. He was uh, awarded by the Minister of Transportation in Indonesia for the performance of transportation services safety and implementing the transportation safety regulation back in 2016 and also uh, followed by the optimal transportation service in Lebaran 2017 program uh, two years before 2019. And uh, now, PT Dirgantara Indonesia is also preparing the Nurtanio N219, the recent airplane made by PT Dirgantara Indonesia, which now also attempt to produce the commercial airplane which, with a capacity of 50 passengers on board. And he will be talking more about that later on. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel. And last but not least, also present on stage is acting CEO of GMF Aero Asia, Mr. Tazar Marta Kurniawan, please welcome. He has an extensive professional career for 24 years with strong operational and business development leadership, accomplishment in aircraft business industry, and now he's uh, trusted as acting CEO of GMF Aero Asia as well as director of business and base operation of GMF Aero Asia since uh, May 2018. And uh, PT Garuda Maintenance Facility Aero Asia Trabuka is an Indonesian company that concentrates particularly on aircraft maintenance, repair, and overhaul, or MRO. And PT GMF Aero Asia is also named as one of the largest and leading aircraft maintenance facilities in Asia, which provides services worldwide. So these are our distinguished panelists. Um, 
Before we uh, start this session, uh, I'd like to just give a, an overview of what we're going to, bo to be talking about in this session. We are going to be talking about connectivity. And uh, as we all know, connectivity and um, its supporting infrastructure play a most uh, strategic role in strengthening not only economic growth, industry, trade, and sustainable development, uh, but also other sectors as well. Uh, not only the development of physical infrastructures, such as maybe um, airports, ports, roads, and also railway networks, but also let's not forget other areas of strategic concern in connectivity, such as energy and also digital connectivity. And these are perhaps areas of cooperation that can also be scaled up, strengthened, and uh, expanded between Indonesia and Africa. So before we go to our panelists, I'd just like uh, for a quick reminder for the audience that you can also be submitting your questions through the Slido. And in order to do this, uh, all you have to do is just from your smartphone, uh, go to www.slido.com and enter the event code and submit your questions. And the question with the most vote will go directly to the panelists. So please do that. And we'll be taking the questions later on. OK, so enough about uh, <laughs> the introduction. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Minister Rudiantara. Um, can you give us an overview of how Indonesia um, became one of the hottest startup hubs in the world? What did it take for Indonesia to build its digital and also telco infrastructures? And uh, why do you think Indonesia stands to gain from these efforts, Minister? Uh, thank you, Kania. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon all of us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. When we are talking on the connectivity, we needed the connectivity for what? To transport, to transfer goods and people. If you don't transfer or transport goods and people, you don't need connectivity. Uh, for that one, we need the physical connectivity, which is whether air transport, land transport, or sea transport to support trade and tourism because we need to transport people as well for traveling. And on top of that one, we need an additional connectivity, virtual connectivity, which is digital connectivity that will lead us to the new economy, what we call is the digital economy. Indonesia, from infrastructure, ICT uh, point of view, we are pretty much okay. But we have to admit that even in ASEAN, we are not number one. Why? Due to the geographical situations. Indonesia is pretty much land uh, archipelago countries. Can I have the slide, please? Archipelago countries. We are consist of the 13,000 islands, you know, and we have to be able to connect the whole regions throughout the country. And even sometime, my friend also challenged me, Rudy, are you sure that, that Indonesia have 13,000 island? And jokingly, I said, whether we count it during the high tide or low tide. <laughs> no, anyway, we have an ambitious plan to connect the whole regions or major cities throughout the countries by the backbone connectivity, backbone of broadband. It's not only internet, but the high-speed internet, what we call is the broadband. Mm. So we started this program in 2015. Alhamdulillah, right now, construction's done. Now we are in the last month on to integrate the palaparing. We have palaparing on the western part of Indonesia, central part of Indonesia, and the eastern part of uh, Indonesia. So by second, uh, third week of September, we were able to integrate the whole network. So there will be no single regions out of 514 regions and major cities that are not connected by the broadband transmission. The most important thing is not only to build the ICT infrastructures, in parallel, we have also to think how are you going to maximize the use of these infrastructures. All economic activities mostly are using digital technology right now. 
when people traveling by airline. So we hardly seen the people buy the voucher from the travel bureau and redeem the vouchers in the airport and redeem it and change by the boarding pass anymore. When we travel, we would like to stay in the hotel. It is hardly we see that people buy the vouchers and redeem the vouchers in the, sorry, redeems the, the key rooms in the receptionist by exchanging the vouchers. All reservations, all payments yeah, has gone through the digital means. So that's why Indonesia, again, we are having the, an ambitious plan that Indonesia is the leader of the digital economy in the country. By next year, 2030, Indonesia digital economy will reach 130 billion US dollars, which reflect slightly over 11% of our total GDP. And Indonesia nowadays becoming the center of development of the startup. We have right now three unicorns and one decacorn. Even another unicorn or decacorn in the regions, so they won't become the unicorn or decacorn if they don't have presence in Indonesia. Why? Because we have market. We have 40%. We represent 40% of the total population, the total market in, in this region. Coming back to the infrastructure, it is not easy to build the infrastructure, ICT infrastructure in Indonesia. We have to cover the very remote area. When we viewed this morning on Jakarta, Jakarta is very metropolitan cities. They have world class standard, whether from the ICT infrastructure for transportation, whatever it is. But Indonesia is not only Jakarta. Can we Move to another slide, please. I'll show you how we have to build the connectivity in the other region in Indonesia. Sometimes we have to tow the antenna, the satellite, uh, the antenna of the satellite by Buffalo because we don't have any infrastructure over there. In the Papua, we have to build the tower, 28 locations where we don't have any path. So we have to bring all of the goods, all of the materials built in the 3,000 meter altitude and bring everything, all bring the logistics by helicopter. Even we have to bring the water into the gallon by the helicopter. But that's how we built Indonesia. Regardless whether in the metropolitan city, regardless this is in the village on the remote area. African countries, the internet penetration right now is around 39%. But my friends here, my brothers who are sitting next to me, his internet penetration is, is more slightly over 60% already. It's one of the advanced countries in the, in the African countries. You know. But overall, it's 39%. This is a challenge. While worldwide, ITU yeah, said that slightly over half of the population in the world are connected by internet. What we need is not only internet, by the broadband, the high-speed internet. And this is the challenge for us. This is the challenge for Africa, this is the challenge for the world, and this is the challenge for Indonesia. But having this kind of experience, I have discussed with my counterpart from Africa, starting 2017, when we were in Busan. Why don't we go together and ask World Bank to finance this project, to increase, to speed up, to expedite the development of the construction of the ICT infrastructures in Africa? We can learn from other countries, not only from Indonesia, we can learn from other countries how they do build the connectivity of the broadband. I think by this, I would like to conclude my short remarks by saying that connectivity, the digital connectivity is still an issue with us. Probably for Africa and Indonesia, it's not only digital connectivity, even the physical connectivity still also the issue for us. This is something that we have to address uh, together. But to me, to Indonesia, yes, we think this is the problem, but with the, our experience, then we have to turn it to become, this is our opportunity to accelerate the development, the constructions of the ICT infrastructure wherever 
in the world or worldwide. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for that, Minister. So basically, Indonesia wants to, be, to bring the expertise that we have gained uh, by developing our, our ICT early on, although we still have issues. Uh, there is no perfect country in the world having the experience, you know, mm -hmm. but at least we can exchange the views and share the experience. Uh, whenever it's fit one and another, why, why don't we enter the seals? Okay, very well. Let, let's, let's see what uh, Minister Amara has to say about this. Um, uh, before before uh, commenting on what uh, Minister Rudiantara just mentioned, how we can uh, see uh, uh, the acceleration of ICT infrastructure as one of the, the opportunities that can be collaborated for, further between Indonesia and the African countries, uh, maybe perhaps Minister can can give us a, an overview in, in what has been done in Morocco in supporting connectivity uh, between building logistics and transportation capabilities, maybe such as ports, airports, roads and railways, uh, but also to digital telecommunication infrastructure. Um, which do you prior to, pri prioritize the most at the moment and why? Salam alaikum. Merci de me permettre euh, d'intervenir dans ce panel. En fait, euh, euh, on est en train de parler de, de l'infrastructure d'une manière générale et de la coopération entre le continent africain et l'Indonésie. Et c'est très important d'avoir une, une idée qui nous permettrait un petit peu de cadrer cette, euh, cette coopération. Parce qu'il est clair, et je n'invente rien, que l'infrastructure est un soubassement fondamental pour toute compétitivité économique qui est recherchée par notre continent africain. Donc il est très important pour que cette coopération entre l'Indonésie et l'Afrique qui est basé sur des relations politiques excellentes, sur des relations historiques excellentes, qui puisse avoir un, un tournant important dans la consolidation des relations euh, économiques. Euh, L'Afrique est actuellement un continent qui est très prisé de par le monde. Donc il y a beaucoup de pays qui cherchent à investir en Afrique, qui cherchent à commercer avec l'Afrique. L'Afrique est devenue un continent incontournable à l'échelle mondiale. Mais ce que l'Afrique voudrait justement de la part de l'Indonésie, et c'est très important, et ça a été dit dans le premier panel, c'est qu'on puisse trouver un, un partenariat gagnant-gagnant. Et quand on parle d'un partenariat gagnant-gagnant, ça veut dire un partenariat qui permet d'avoir un équilibre euh, d'une part entre l'Indonésie et, et, et le continent africain. Et à mon sens, on peut le faire euh, à travers euh, plusieurs actions euh, qui permettraient justement à ce partenariat euh, de profiter aussi bien au continent africain et de profiter à l'Indonésie et d'éviter, et j'insiste sur ça, les erreurs qui ont été commises au passé par un certain nombre de pays. Euh, quand on parle de l'infrastructure d'une manière générale, comme je l'avais dit, qui est un soubassement euh, important pour la compétitivité économique, il faut savoir que les infrastructures coûtent énormément cher. Euh, vous avez, madame, euh, posé la question sur ce que nous avons fait au Royaume du Maroc. Euh, depuis une vingtaine d'années, nous avons investi à coût de milliards de dollars pour avoir des aéroports internationaux, pour avoir des ports euh, ouverts au commerce international, pour avoir des autoroutes et des routes qui permettent de désenclaver un certain nombre de nos régions au Maroc. Et c'est ça ce qui nous a permis justement de pouvoir attirer des investissements 
de par le monde, que ce soit des investissements européens, américains, japonais, coréens ou autres. Et puisqu'on est en train de parler de la connectivité, il est impossible de pouvoir penser, développer une économie, développer un commerce sans que les infrastructures soient des infrastructures à niveau. Alors, à titre d'exemple, il y a une vingtaine d'années, au Maroc, on avait à peu près 400 km d'autoroutes et de routes express. Maintenant, nous avons plus de 3000 km euh, d'autoroutes et de routes express qui ont permis de lier 80% de la population marocaine et de la plupart euh, des régions économiques du pays. Euh, il y a euh, à peine quelques mois, nous avons inauguré la ligne grande vitesse entre Tanger et Casablanca, ce qui nous a permis de lier quatre régions économiques. Tanger, qui est une région industrielle, notamment dans l'automobile, avec Casablanca, qui est le cœur économique du Maroc, avec la région de Kenitra, qui est une région aussi orientée vers l'automobile, et avec Rabat, la capitale administrative. Bien sûr, quand on parle de train grande vitesse qui fait 320 km à l'heure, qui permet de lier Tanger à Casablanca en 1h20, c'est justement pour booster l'investissement, pour permettre aux entreprises de pouvoir euh, euh, travailler à l'aise, travailler dans le confort, et bien sûr leur donner toute le, la, la pleine capacité euh, d'investir. Alors quand je dis que c'est des investissements qui coûtent cher, bien sûr on est en train de parler pratiquement de 2,4 milliards de dollars comme investissement dans cette ligne de grande vitesse. Quand il y a une vingtaine d'années, on avait 27 ports. Maintenant, nous en avons plus de 41 ports. Le plus grand port de l'Afrique qui se trouve à Tangemed, qui va permettre de traiter plus de 9 millions de conteneurs, c'est un investissement entre le secteur public et le secteur privé qui a coûté plus de 8 milliards de dollars. Et quand on parle justement des aéroports, nous avons essayé que toutes les régions du Maroc puissent avoir un aéroport ouvert à l'international, justement parce que cette connectivité est essentielle pour que, pour que la croissance puisse suivre. Quand on parle également de ce que nous avons fait en matière de réforme de la gouvernance, et ça c'est très important, parce que nous avons pratiquement, depuis quelques années, initié, euh, à force j'allais dire, un partenariat public-privé, en, en invitant pratiquement le privé à investir davantage dans le domaine euh, des, des, des infrastructures. Alors, moi, je vois euh, que la coopération entre l'Indonésie et l'Afrique pourrait justement se situer à ce niveau. On a besoin, justement, qu'on puisse commercer entre euh, l'Afrique et l'Indonésie. Donc, il faut développer une connectivité maritime euh, importante. Il faut développer une connectivité euh, aérienne. Nous avons besoin également que les sociétés indonésienne puisse s'installer en Afrique, investir en Afrique et comme je l'avais dit, trouver donc un, un bon deal, un deal gagnant-gagnant euh, où il y aura bien sûr un transfert de, de technologie, où il y aura bien sûr euh, des joints ventures qui permettent un petit peu ce partage de capitaux et euh, également qu'il y ait un, un soubassement de coopération entre les institutions officielles en matière euh, technique et managérielle. Et, et je pense que euh, l'Indonésie pourra trouver une place euh, de choix euh, dans le continent africain. Euh, il est très important de signaler que l'Afrique a essayé, euh, bon gré, mal gré, il faut dire, de développer des blocs régionaux euh, à l'échelle du continent africain parce que c'est un grand euh, continent nous nous acheminons maintenant vers une zone de libre-échange continentale qui est un grand défi euh, pour l'Afrique et justement euh, tous les pays africains sont conscients 
de l'importance d'abord de lier les pays africains par une infrastructure ferroviaire, routière, aérienne digne de ce nom qui permettrait justement à, à cette zone de libre-échange euh, de s'épanouir euh, correctement. Donc voilà les, 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 les grands défis et je pense que l'Indonésie a toute sa place justement dans, dans, dans ce schéma futur. Euh, il reste juste à signaler que, euh, que nous sommes, euh, au Royaume du Maroc, nous sommes conscients de l'importance de développer une coopération sud-sud. Parce que la coopération sud-sud, déjà, elle a l'avantage de permettre d'échanger de, de, des expériences qui sont pratiquement... Euh, similaire avec euh, bien sûr euh, une connaissance mutuelle euh, des problèmes des uns euh, et des autres et justement dans notre politique euh, étrangère marocaine nous donnons beaucoup d'importance à cette euh, coopération sud-sud je signale juste euh, que pour nous au Maroc sa majesté le roi a effectué plus d'une soixantaine de visites à l'échelle du continent africain c'est ce qui a permis justement qu'on puisse tisser de plus en plus des relations euh, économiques euh, gagnant-gagnant qui permettent justement à, 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 à l'Afrique de s'affirmer euh, sur la scène internationale. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, uh, let us move uh, to Her Excellency Aisha Mohamed Moussa, who is also here with us. Uh, perhaps we can um, also give us an overview of what has been the lesson learned, what has been done to strengthen connectivity in Ethiopia, and uh, which areas of collaboration do you see as potential being uh, expanded between Indonesia and the African countries? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Ministers of Republic of Indonesia, representatives of African countries, representatives of specialized, specialized institutions, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. On behalf of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and my own behalf, I would like to extend my gratitude to the government of Indonesia for inviting our country to this special moment. For us, connectivity is a cornerstone of regional e economic cooperation and integration and has become a major priority for the countries of Asia and Africa, especially in the context of efforts to find new drivers of regional economic growth and to create additional domestic and aggregate regional demand. Let me explain shortly what's going on in Ethiopia to improve this economic cooperation and integration. Ethiopia's location gives its strategic dominance as a jumping off point in the Horn of Africa, close to the Middle East, Europe, Asia, and its market. Ethiopia's economy experiences a strong and broad-based growth, averaging 10.3% last 10 years compared to the regional average of 5.4%. Uh, Now Ethiopia is increasingly, increasingly being recognized as a, an attractive country for local and foreign investments. Between 2008 to 2018, the country has witnessed a more than tenfold increase of foreign direct investments, which grew from $100 million, million dollars to $1.5 billion. The sectors such as uh, industry and agro-processing that were practically inexistent two decades ago are now in the focus, thanks to cheap and trainable labor force, affordable electricity, and huge availability of raw materials. The attractiveness is set to further increase in the next coming years. According to our plan, the country will rank among the Africa's top four manufacturing hubs by 2025, in which the country visioned to become middle-income country. To achieve the status of the regional manufacture and agricultural hub, Ethiopia needs to take advantage of its unique location close to the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. Ethiopian airlines 
commands to the lion's share of the Pan-African passengers and core cargo network, operating the youngest and most modern fleet to more than 100 international destinations across five continents, including Indonesia. The carrier also served 20 domestic passengers destinations and 44 cargo destinations. Ethiopian airline is Africa's largest airline in terms of passengers carried, destination served, fleet and fleet size and revenue. Ethiopia's airline also had the world's fourth largest airline by the number of countries served. The road infrastructure has been developing fast in the Ethiopian, Ethiopia during the, the past years. And the government of Ethiopia anticipates to further expand the country's road network to 220,000 kilometers in the end of the year 2020. There is also aggressive uh, investment on building an extensive rail network. The railway network project will significantly improve Ethiopia's international trade by reducing trade logistics costs and time of delivery. The new electric railway cuts transport time from Djibou Port Djibouti to Ethiopia from the current eight four hours to ten, just 10 hours. Cargo capacity on the rail network is also increasing from 3,500 to 4,000 tons of freight per train with Ethiopian Railway Cooperation, anticipating to increase it to six, from six to seven million tons of cargo per year in the first year of cooperation. Cargo volume will increase to 10 million tons of, in the mid-term of, uh, mid year of 2020. The railways network plan aims to connect Ethiopia with all its neighboring countries and provide access to the number of ports like Djibouti, Kenya, Eritrea, South Sudan, and Somalia. Priorities have been set based on the need to move commodities such as potash, coffee, agricultural and industrial product, products out of the country and import capital and customer goods to Ethiopia. The government of Ethiopia is currently improving a 2 billion national logistics development strategy to alleviate trade logistics hurdles. Under this strategy, the government of Ethiopia aspires to expand its railway network, targeting an enhancement of the country's export competitiveness by significantly reducing trade logistics costs. As part of this plan, the government will further expand its railway network through 1,545 kilometers linking all the seven major dry ports and towns of the country. The shipping, also, shipping sector also plays a significant role by transporting significant amount of import and export cargoes to Ethiopia. Ethiopian Telecom, previously known as Ethiopian Telecommunication Cooperation Corporation, is an integrated telecommunication service provider in Ethiopia, providing internet and telephone services. Ethiopian Telecom is owned by Ethiopian government and maintenance, maintains a monopoly over all the, the telecommunication services in the country. But our government decided the tel Ethiopian Telecom to be one company by, with two wings, service provider and infrastructure developer. Mm -hmm. So recently, our government is, as you know, is going into economic and political reforms. The government is embarking into partial privatization of state-owned companies, mm -hmm. such as Ethiopian Telecom, Ethiopian Sherry Shipping and Logistics Service Enterprise, and Ethiopian Airlines. In order to, this is to do, to boost the quality and quantity of connectivity and its supporting infrastructure for efficient and domestic and international trade activities. This is part of the economic reforms currently going on in the country. Finally, I would like to reaffirm that the Ethiopian government is very keen to work with Republic of Indonesia and its uh, African countries also 
and its people in infrastructure connectivity improvement and other feasible areas of uh, these historic countries for mutual trade, prosperity, and development. So if any companies, companies from Indonesia can also invest in our partial uh, privatization companies like Ethiopian Airlines and Ethiopian Telecom and also logistics company that is owned by uh, the government. So there are a lot of opportunities in the country with a lot of uh, manpower and very cheap electricity which is uh, uh, under construction that for the time being and there are also reforms taking uh, place in the country with regulatory mechanisms to to minimize the uh, business uh, doing uh, efforts in the country and we are very keen to work with any, any investment companies and any governments to, who wants to invest in our country and thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, and next I'll be asking the same question to, um, to Her Excellency uh, Pamela Charlotte as well. Uh, to give us an overview as well. Maybe perhaps uh, Indonesia and the Seychelles have a lot more in common, both uh, a nation of islands. It can be quite challenging, as was mentioned earlier by the minister, uh, Rudiantara as well, uh, how to build connectivity and, and enhance infrastructure to support uh, more connectivity in the country. Can you tell us about your experience and what has been the lesson learned? And what do you think are the areas of potential collaboration that can be supported between Indonesia and the African countries. Okay. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Or should I say good afternoon? It's afternoon. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, moderator. I believe that Seychelles and Indonesia has so much in common, mm -hmm. being uh, island states. Um, uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean, we have 115 islands only a small population of uh, 97,000, so uh, unlike uh, Indonesia. Um, uh, Seychelles is mostly tourism and uh, fisheries, um, export in fisheries. Mm. So for us, connectivity means it's, it's very pertinent. It means a lot, um, uh, especially this is uh, um, in sync with our infrastructure development. It has we have to um, uh, develop uh, the infrastructure um, connections. Um, uh, currently, for example, Seychelles have 15, uh, air, um, have a, an open sky policy with 15 airlines coming to, to, to Seychelles. We have 18, 80 air services agreements and this will allow, um, will allow uh, cargo and uh, tourist uh, trade. Um, uh, for, the, for our inf um, airport infrastructure, we are we, trying to um, expand on the existing infrastructure that we have. Actually, we've just opened, um, uh, well, opened uh, uh, our new domestic terminal mm. because connectivity with other islands of mm. Seychelles is also very important, especially where tourism is concerned. Um, uh, uh, with regards to port, we've, we have a project for a port expansion, uh, $41 million uh, um, guaranteed uh, with the World Bank, um, uh, the European Union and European Investment Bank. And um, this will also help us in the shipping, shipping um, industry, um, trade, cargo, um, and also in the cruise ship industry. Um, uh, we have a new cruise ship terminal that will be added to the port expansion. Um, so there's, there's, more, uh, there's many opportunities uh, um, um, we, can, we can get from all the challenges that we are facing. Mm. Um, especially uh, island states uh, who are also um, very, very vulnerable uh, and we need to build our resilience uh, um, against uh, climate change. Um, and Seychelles have been at the forefront of the, uh, of the climate change um, um, agenda. 
and uh, we feel that uh, there should be more um, knowledge or expertise uh, uh, in that sector. And how do we build our infrastructures to, um, to be more resilient against uh, climate change? Um, the renewable energy um, also is, will be very important um, going forward. Um, as as uh, I mentioned, uh, climate change, also we need to uh, look at towards renewable energy. Um, Seychelles is, is, um, is uh, progressing in that, on that front. Um, we, uh, we have many um, solar, solar PV schemes or programs that we have, uh, we have um, launched in, in the country for our citizens. Uh, we are also looking at LNG um, rather than uh, uh, the, fu the f fuel itself, um, but the infrastructure has to be, has, has to be there. Um, there's, uh, you know, um, a challenge for us is, uh, is financing. Because Seychelles is a high-income country, is considered as a high-income country, it it's, has not been easy for us to get uh, the financing. Um, uh, when you look at uh, the blue, blue economy, which is one of the um, current industry which Seychelles is championing uh, worldwide, uh, we've, we launched the, the world's uh, first sovereign bond, which is the blue bond, which is an, an innovative way of financing a uh, blue economy. So um, I think uh, we should, uh, Indonesia or Africa should look at other um, innovative uh, financial schemes uh, that can help in uh, the, the development of infrastructure. So um, yes, um, we, I believe Seychelles as a small state uh, has a lot to learn from the African continent, but also the, also the Asian continent. And uh, there, there, there can be cooperations between, uh, between the, the, the two continents. Um, uh, uh, but it has to be a win-win uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for a small island state like Seychelles, we don't have, we don't have um, minerals or we don't have any, anything that, uh, apart from the trading of the fisheries and tourism that we can uh, really um, trade. Uh, but I think we, we, we can trade on expertise, uh, um, on the expertise, technical assistance, um, and see how we can improve on the infrastructure and, uh, and connect um, uh, uh, the island states and the African continent and Asia. Um, and so that we are able to, to trade uh, together. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, that was a little bit. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, those are the viewpoints of the governments, let's say. And uh, there was a lot of mention about what uh, we can gain and what needs to be done. And all agree that infrastructure is a very important um, driver for economic growth and trade as well and there needs and there is a potential collaboration that can be established between Indonesia and the African countries but it needs to be a partnership of mutual benefit of mutual grounds and I want to delve a little bit more on what is considered a win-win situation and how to start it but before we go there I'd like to go over to our uh, business panelists from the private sector, stay in enterprises from Indonesia. I think we brought the right panelists uh, for this session because uh, I think each one of them uh, has a lot to offer in terms of uh, building connectivity. Railways was mentioned a lot uh, during the discussion before this. Maybe uh, we can start with uh, Mr. Zaki Gamal Yassin, the CEO of Lend Industry, to talk more about uh, what your company is doing and is, uh, has Lend uh, established business uh, connections with the African countries. Uh, I know that Lend Industry took place uh, or took part in the Palaparing project, which is a very big, pro big project for Indonesia. 
establishing a national fiber optic cable network that spans across all 34, country, uh, all 34 provinces. So you have a lot of expertise in building a, a, a broadband network as a backbone for digital connectivity in Indonesia. But you're also familiar with the renewable energies. You're also developing uh, solar panels. So talk a little bit more about what land industry in, is doing and what it can offer uh, to the table for the African countries. Okay. Thank you, Kania. Uh, Excellency ministers and all the delegation, good day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, nowadays, we're talking connectivity and network infrastructure is a vital part for the increasing in economic for the country. Yeah. And with the good co connectivity, all the development move ever fast, uh, get faster. And PT land industry, a lot of uh, project involved regarding the uh, connectivity infrastructure in Indonesia. Because our strengths uh, in electronic system integrator for the infra infrastructures and uh, industry. Our have a five uh, business unit. First, for ICT and navigation and renewable energy and power system and we involved too for the defense electronic transportation system especially for railway and industrial sector in terms of the connectivity uh, development uh, project in indonesia there are a lot of uh, fit land involved such as uh, the moderator said uh, we just finished the, the big project for the build the fiber optic uh, network back, uh, broadband back, backbone I mean in uh, Palaparing for the central uh, of Indonesia and we build a lot of uh, renewable energy we have more than the 35 megawatt uh, solar uh, energy and for the transportation uh, sector especially for the railway sector we built the all the national strategic project in mainland both for the intercity and commuter line we also involved for the all urban uh, railway which has been developed for the within the last uh, five years the we delivered the railway system for the Indonesian International Airport, uh, Sukarno Harta. This is the first driverless rubber tire, rubber tire train in Indonesia. This is already uh, operation for the connect all the terminal in that airport. And LRT in South uh, Sumatra, this is the first LRT in Indonesia using the ATGS level one technology. And we involved all the project for LRT in Jakarta, in the urban uh, transportation in the uh, West Java too. And for the entering uh, market in, in Africa, we focusing in two sector. One, for the railway uh, project. We under consortium we with the PT Wika and Inca we call the Indonesian Railway Development Incorporated for the Africa we offer the railway total solution not only for the passengers railway in urban and intercity but also to freight railway for the freight railway we offer the positive train control technology. This is the very latest uh, technology for the freight uh, uh, railway. We are sufficient the uh, very long distance track, minimize the track site equipment, and low investment than 
and minimize for the vandalism. In the regard of the building of the African Railway, we start for the, uh, in Madagascar. We hope the we can project can start the, uh, in the few uh, next year. And the second thing for the renewable energy, we already got uh, contact with the local, our partner, like in Morocco, for the build the power plant for uh, solar uh, energy. And very interesting uh, opportunity in Africa that uh, we're trying to expand our expertise in uh, Africa. Several changes so far we have uh, faced getting like uh, uh, funding. That's why we entering market in Africa with, together with the state on the other the state and company. And thank you very much for your attention. Very well, thank you for that. So what has been, if you can pinpoint one main challenge that you had to face in accessing the African market, what would it would be financing? Yes, yeah. Uh, we cannot uh, entering that uh, market with, by ourselves. Mm. We should be together. We give the total solution, especially mm. for the uh, railway. We bring with the Vijay Kalyo for the infrastructure and rolling stock from Inca and land for the uh, signaling, electronic, mm -hmm. and uh, telecommunication. That's uh, one of our strengths to give the total solution to the, our customer in, in Africa. Okay, very well. Uh, let's move on to Pa Elvin Guntoro, who is also the CEO of PT Dirgantara Indonesia, an airplane manufacturers and has also sold products to the African market. You can tell us a little bit more about what your company is doing and what has been some of the challenges that you have to face when establishing uh, more business in between uh, Indonesia and Africa. Thank you, Kania. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here today with you all. PT Dikantara Indonesia is one of the indigenous uh, aircraft industry in Asia with the uh, core business medium and light to prof aircraft. And we have uh, four line of business aircraft and then aerostructure and aircraft services. And the last is technology, technological services. Since PT Dekandra Indonesia established in 1976, we already delivered 438 aircraft and helicopters. Four aircraft from those is, we has delivered to African countries, CN-235, Test 200, go to Burkina Faso, Chinua, and Senegal. Mm. Meanwhile, we have one contract still producing in my factory for Senegal, CN235, will be delivered next year. This year, we, all, we will deliver as well to ASEAN countries and two CN21 to Thailand and then one CN235 to Nepal for this the end of this year. We targeted in Africa two more aircraft CN235 from Senegal and from Burkina Faso that has been signed last year in this room as well. Mm. Hopefully we will con get contract for this. And the secondly, by looking at so huge, uh, so big CN235 and NC212 in Africa, would like to offer upgrading, modernization, 
MRO, Maintenance, Repair and Overhaul for those aircraft. And the last, there is an opportunity is a potential market for replacing the fleet that you already used today in the next, for the next 10 years, probably is around 200 more and it's a big market for us, for aircraft industry. There are three products from PT Dirkantara Indonesia in responding to this connectivity challenge. This aircraft is a small or medium to proof aircraft, uh, which are very optimal in increasing connectivity of domestic short and medium whole flight in one region. The first is uh, N219, it's a new development from PT Dirkantara Indonesia. It's 19 passengers, it's commercial aircraft. This is suitable for mountaineers and also accessible to be operated in the remote and mountainous area. And then 219 can be short takeoff and landing only 600 meters, less than 600. And, and unpaved runway can take off and landing in unpaved runway. The second aircraft that we offer is CN NC212E. This is a improved version from NC212 that you already have in Africa. Provide performance and versatile with proven experience in the most uh, varied environment and extremely demanding mission. This is the same. There is a rear in the rear door and there is a rear door is easily to carry out the logistic for this uh, connectivity in for each region. And this is a short intake of landing as well. It's less than 1,000 uh, runway. We, as we know all that most of African airport, airports has, have a short runway. That is why we offer that one. And then the last that we already delivered to uh, three countries and will be delivered in Senegal is CN235-200. This is a very good uh, because this is a, there is a rear door as well. Chief operation can be used uh, more 11 hours flight for, for example, uh, maritime patrol and, and then maritime surveillance of your countries. This is short and take off landing as well, around 1,000. Uh, this is, you can carry out 49 troops in this aircraft as well, uh, CN-25. Uh, next, probably, I would like to explain what the challenge that we face for doing business with Africa's countries. Uh, of course, we have a limited resource to direct uh, penetrate market to Africa P2G because of uh, the far from our country and then also financial problem as well we have faced in, 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 in doing business in, the, in yours. So what we will suggest, we will propose our uh, proposal to you is we are working with uh, foreign minister, minister foreign and affairs. So minister foreign affairs, for example, uh, Athan or uh, ambassador can be 
our representative there, the embassy can be our office there, and we can do business collaboration with uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. The second, probably we can establish as well uh, with uh, local companies that already done before, such as Editrit, that we doing business in Senegal. And the last, probably we can uh, suggest G2G in order to make an umbrella because when we have a G2G scheme, we can get obtain national interest account from Indonesian Exim Bank. So we, we can get the buyer's credit or working capital uh, will be benefits for manufacture or for buyers as well. So this scheme hopefully can be real realization in the near future, not only with national interest account, but also we offer, when we have a G2G uh, scheme, we can offer transfer of technology, such as uh, we can develop MRO uh, in the local companies in Africa. So you can um, maintain your aircraft by yourself, and then we just come for supervise for this. This is what we can uh, give a solution to uh, African countries. The last is we can do balance trade or counter trade. We can bring our uh, state-owned enterprise synergy with us to do business uh, for counter trade from your natural resources that you have lots in Africa. I think that's all I can uh, explain it to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that. And last but not least, I'd like for uh, Mr. Tazar Marta Kurniawan, acting CEO of GMG Aero Asia, to talk a little bit more about uh, the kind of support that is needed to establish more business in between Indonesia and the African countries. Okay, thank you, Kenya, for this opportunity, and also thank you for Excellency Minister from Indonesia and also from African country for sharing with us here, and also for the whole delegation who attend this uh, uh, panel discussion today. Good afternoon, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, in this occasion, for the first, I would like to explain about the, at a glance about the GMF AeroAsia itself. GMF AeroAsia is the subsidiary of the state-owned enterprises, subsidiary of the Garuda Indonesia Airlines. So GMF has already established their maintenance organization since 65 years ago. So we already have the 65 combined experience. And nowadays, uh, our present, uh, our main facility, GMF AeroAsia, we are located in the Sukarno Atta Airport, and we are kind of the best and biggest aircraft maintenance MRO companies in this region. Why? We mentioned like that since, as you see that in Chengkareng, GMF AeroAsia have totally four hangars at the moment, and then totally we have 32 line slot for the heavy maintenance and also the light maintenance. So we occupy about 970,000 square meters. So one of our hangars, our hangars number four, is the biggest narrow body hangars in the world. So these hangars we built with, together with other state-owned enterprise who are doing the construction is Petewika, which you can also in the first panel discussion so this is something that a remarkable effort that we already done and then we already enjoy the growth of GMF through this kind of the facility. So GMF now already is serving more than 60 countries and then uh, we already have certification from 24 countries and majority we already have from the prime countries like the FAA from United States and also from EASA from the European. 
Besides our local authority, we already have also from Australian authority uh, certification. So what we can offer to this kind of the uh, business to supporting the airline operation? So we're starting with the aircraft selection. Whenever the new company or the new airline want to hire the aircraft, so we can help to choose with aircraft that's suitable, even, uh, even though there's the new aircraft, brand, brand new aircraft, or also the used aircraft. So we can also develop maintenance planning or maintenance program for the airline and also providing material provisioning needed for their operation and also the manpower readiness. So the, the whole of the, what we call it, the, the process needed to operation of the aircraft so we can provide it. And the most important thing that uh, needed for their aircraft maintenance activity since they need thousands of the technician yeah, for doing the aircraft maintenance. Now GMF Aero Asia is already expanding their business into what we call the manpower supply. So GMF now is already subsid has subsidiary called the GDPS. They can provide the technician. A technician not only to our operation, but we can also provide for the others MRO or airlines needed. So, uh, so let's talk about the, how promising the African markets in the aviation business. So we can see this while the MRO spending or the maintenance spending worldwide only enjoying 0.5% growth, but we can see from the information that Africa's African aviation market will grow about 5% annually. This is all about the same with what the growth that exists in the Asia market. So considering also with the Africa is set to become one of the fastest growing aviation region in the next 20 years, and also considering of the six of the world 12 fastest growing country are in the Africa. So we do believe that Africa will enjoy the prospect to the growth of the aviation. So it's meant that by the growth of the aviation and also the airline, they potentially also the same growth of the maintenance activity. We do believe that uh, Africa is still growing in this and we noted the in Africa also has already some of the uh, aircraft maintenance like in Morocco and also in Ethiopia, they also grow significantly. But what we can offer is, back to the, my previous slide, I also mentioned that currently GMF Asia has already collaborated with nine polytechnic and two university. We are already developed the diploma tree for the aircraft technician. So it means that we can create it, thousands of the people to be the technician every year. So by considering that GMS is already have the loyal customer all over the world, so now this is the time for GMF to contribute to the development of the Africa aviation industry to be in our MRO network. Mm. So let me see what is the last that we can do is, this is kind of the collaboration that we may develop with Africa. So GMF has the international footprint as a part of our inorganic growth. So it's already started with the establishing the company in Australia and also we are now developing also the MRO or maintenance in the Middle East. So considering that the MRO is something that we can develop has to be close to the customer. So the proximity to the customers is very needed in this kind of the, uh, the business. So we, we cannot ask our customer to fly more than eight hours to our facility, but it will be more economical for them yeah, to be done in the region when we establish the MRO. So that's why part of our 
network MRO that we are going to establish, we can offer that Africa is one of our new or the next expansion that we are going to do. So potentially for us to get the customer from the four hours distance from the Africa to come to the Africa. So the things that we are going to offer to the Africa is not only to fulfill the African market, but this is something to fulfill our existing customers that we have at the moment. So that's something that uh, we can offer to any African countries who want to join to develop with us. We have the technician here to be delivered then. When we can also to develop the African people to do the training to be the aircraft technician. So that's the things that we are going to offer. So at least maybe the challenge for us is how can we acquire the land like the same size what we have now is about 970,000 square meters. And so how we can get the privilege about the 50 years to occupy the land and the rest is only about how we can grab the markets together. So that's the thing maybe that I can share today. Thank you. Thank you again. That's really good news. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I really wish I had time to pick some questions from the slide. Oh, there are a couple of uh, excellent questions that are, uh, that are submitted by, by you. But uh, since uh, we have uh, time constraint, there is a possibility that the president might be uh, coming in earlier. So I would just like to wrap up our discussion for this session. But I hope uh, what has been discussed uh, can be um, further elaborated. As was uh, mentioned during this dis the discussion, some of the areas of collaboration that have been identified so far are maritime and also air connectivity. Also, uh, although uh, Minister Rudiantara also mentioned how digital connectivity is also an equal strategic uh, area uh, of potential collaboration in the future, especially to accelerate the use of infrastructure. Um, um, since infrastructure is, 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 a, is a very expensive, uh, expensive endeavor, of course, uh, there is a need uh, to develop innovative financial scheme ahead. Some of uh, what has been uh, advised or some had w was mentioned earlier by, by the panelists is how uh, we can uh, uh, develop uh, a G to G uh, partnership and also uh, a scheme like the private uh, uh, public partnership to uh, forge ahead and move forward uh, in strengthening collaboration between Indonesia and the African countries. Uh, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for now, but if we can have a big round of applause for the panelists for this session. Thank you again for the discussion and also for, for, for elaborating. Uh, some of the potential collaboration and also the challenges that has been faced in uh, building a stronger relationship between Indonesia and the African countries. Thank you again. Thank you. Let's put our hands together once again to all speakers and moderators.